this is update for May 30, 2024, day 827 of the war, end of the date update. Um, it's also catch up for May 29 and 28. I'm continuing. Um, so I'm going to start this um, now. As usual, with general information, strategic updates, and sort of economic updates, and then I'm going to switch to the situation uh, on the battlefield. So, um, and I'm continuing um, review of all of this macroeconomic information coming from around the world. And uh, today is going to be China and uh, uh, United States of America. So, uh, first, let's uh, start with uh, China. So they had their uh, manufacturing PMI, and I apologize, actually, it's not S&P, it's just their local, um, don't remember the exact name of the company, basically some association of logistics uh, in China. And um, so, as you can see, the manufacturing part is the most important for China, because China is, is manufacturing economy, that's where the uh, value add is generated, and then non-manufacturing essentially uh, fairly I would say uh, non uh, descriptive, non relevant uh, in terms of Chinese economy. So, really, it's about manufacturing. Uh, as you can see, it tilted into negative territory in May. And even what is, you know, if we look under the hood, uh, things really looking uh, pretty bad. So, first of all, uh, prices uh, paid weren't up. So, this really means inflation in China, which usually tends to have deflation. So this is really a negative situation there. And then also new orders, and which means also mostly export orders are down. So this is um, kind of like a worst of both worlds. You have your expenses going up, uh, up and your revenues are going down. So you're basically squeezed. Uh, this, as I said, this is very negative for general, for economy, and obviously for the companies. Uh, then if we look uh, in terms of size of the companies, it also gives us very interesting information. So for large companies, they're actually uh, their situation is actually was sort of in a positive territory. As you can see, it's 52.7. Uh, and I forgot to mention, uh, for those who knew, uh, the key here is that is, um, threshold is 50. Uh, above 50%, uh, it's uh, growing positive below 50 it's negative shrinking so as you can see large companies in china are still doing okay uh, medium companies kind of like on the edge and then definitely the the ones that are struggling the most are small companies you can see and the struggle is really uh quite a, quite significant and especially if you compare disparity between medium and large companies versus uh, small companies you can see significant disparity there uh, however if we look uh, even more specifically, in terms of new orders, uh, we can see that the only segment that's still kind of okay is large companies. It's 51.6%, as you can see. And I would probably attribute this uh, to um, probably um, uh, companies that really around influenced by government, either doing something, making something for government, or some kind of like government order, something along those lines. So this, uh, the, uh, and, and including potentially a military effort as well. So um, so that's probably real explanation for that. Um, for for for, uh, for, um, for that that number being positive, and I'll you know I'll explain a little bit more even why I I, I think that's really the case. And then if you look at the medium companies, they are also shrinking. So uh, new orders is basically your future uh, revenue is was is what's going to happen. It's the best predictor of the future. Uh, so in in some ways, the the ones that I showed before that I uh, talked about before about this large companies, medium companies, and small. Uh, this is just general information. This is more specific and more predictive of the future situation. As you can see, uh, in this case, only large companies is still kind of okay, but mediums. Medium companies are in an, in a negative territory, shrinking, and as you can see, small companies are really in a horrible territory. So, uh, so, so real. So I would say, as a summer, real business in China are is really hurting. 
by that I mean not connected to government exp expenses that's not getting uh, orders from government and so on. So real true, um, you know, mom and pop businesses are in a uh, huge pain in China. And also, if you look at the overall new export orders, they are shrinking as well. So this is why I was saying that lo the, what, what's going on there with new orders uh, for large companies, they're not coming from experts. So it probably has to be uh, some government spending uh, inside of China by government. So they're basically feeding off uh, government and that's obviously um, uh, it's a negative sign it's it's a basically uh, you know fake picture fake uh, it's a waste of resources in a summary so as you can see the, the situation in China looks pretty ugly uh, overall um, manufacturing is in um, is in, in is in decline is in trouble uh, especially if we look at this uh, new export orders and this is probably related to the fact that uh, West is uh, slowly moving um, manufacturing orders from uh, China to uh, to other countries in it, it's it's widespread it's distributed it's not just like one uh, stop shop like used to be with China but it's everywhere it's something goes to Vietnam um, something goes to India, some, you know, all over the place. Something even goes to uh, Latin America. Uh, they are more expensive, uh, but this is the, I would say, the price of confrontation that's being paid by both sides, really. So this is, uh, mm, you know, this is uh, just, uh, I just want to explain that uh, it may be taking, it's just like, okay, just China is suffering. No, West is suffering equally. Uh, through inflation, so uh, everybody's suffering, and and this um, disintegration of the global economy is making everybody worse off. And uh, uh, if this continues, it will become much more painful, and and everybody will feel um, uh, on their own, you know, well-being, their own personal life, the effects of it. So this is. This is not just uh, it's over, done, and so on. If this continues, it's going to get really ugly. Uh, now let's move actually to the U.S. Um, and uh, here uh, I want to mention a couple of things. So first of all, mm, government debt in the U.S. was more or less stable since early March. It's at roughly 34.6 in in the in the range of 34.5 to, to 34.6 trillion. So basically almost for three months it has stabilized. Uh, the reason for that was because it's a uh, it's a collection time for taxes. So basically uh, ordinary citizens who are the main main source of uh, income in, in the U.S., uh, budget they were paying taxes which are due in March and uh, part of April so that was you know and that's taxes for the entire uh, year whoever didn't pay up so basically it's uh, mm, the the tax collections are heavily skewed in US to March uh, April time frame and so that helped to um, uh, stall grows uh, in uh, governmental debt in the US. So it kind of appeared for three, about three months as it stabilized. It does appear it resumed it. Uh, it moved at least a couple days and I'll keep continue tracking that and we'll, we'll see what's happening there. Uh, but um, <clears throat> so that's the situation with government debt there. Then there were number of, uh, the, the numbers for G GDP came out and uh, first quarter, the the growth uh, in the U.S. economy is sharply down, as you can see, 1.3 percent, versus the growth in in the fourth quarter of 23 was 3.4 percent. This is from uh, annualized perspective. So if these things go the way they go, the entire for the entire year, the growth is going to be 1.3 percent. So as you're going to see, it's it's pretty small, like very small growth. And if you look at the components. Um, where, where this number is coming, what driving it, 
so overall as you can see consumption is negative so durable goods so basically this is a consumers who buying i don't know cars like uh, refrigerators things like of, of that nature those are durable goods it's significantly down as you can see negative 4.1 percent uh, the more concerning part is actually consumption of non-durable goods that's something like your food your uh, fuel for your cars sort of like daily uh, small number expenses and as you can see it's down it's uh, speaks um, volume about um, uh, poor financial basically poor uh, financial health of uh, average uh, consumer in the US is clearly consumers are struggling uh, on a personal level in the US uh, what is uh, in terms of actually buying something that they really want let's put this way and especially that that uh, what they want is more concentrated in durable goods so as you can see uh, uh so they are sharply down but it was more concerning is that even like, you know people start you know saving on, on things like food and and, and fuel and, and basically daily sort of small scale expenses that's really happening when people are hurting significantly uh, at the same time, uh, consumers had to pay up uh, significantly more, as you can see, 3.9 for healthcare and you know, all sort of all sorts of insurance. So those are kind of like required expenses, and they're not sort of call it in quotes happy expenses, not expenses that sort of improve your life, make you feel better, and so on. They like you know negative expenses. Uh, this particular health care as you can imagine if you're sick and you're spending it's not something that's generally positive the same is for insurance it's probably all sort of i don't know auto insurance and whatever other insurance is out there again it's not like you're getting something in return for that you're just paying more for the same thing so as you can see the this this uh, paints very bleak picture uh, of the average consumer where um, they paying more for the same stuff and things that are not really truly improving their quality of life and they have to reduce consumption of things that actually improving quality of their life so this ties back to what i was saying that this disintegration of global economy hurting not only china we saw how it you know it's clearly hurting china and it's also hurting us and us consumer so it's double-edged word it hurts both sides uh, and the connection is obviously chinese manufacturing supplying goods to uh, us consumers so as you can see if we cut that tie Chinese manufacturers, manufacturers are uh, hurting and then U.S. consumers are hurting significantly. Uh, then um, let's look at another key component of this GDP is private investments. Uh, they were sort of looked okay, but if you look under the hood, you'll see that mostly it's just residential investments. So basically the expenditure was on, let's say, building houses. In, in theory, this is obviously better, but what this um, metric is is important about is actually investment in in uh, productive uh, assets such as also sort of like factories, manufacturing facilities, and so on. And that was pretty much non-existing. So going back to the story that um, mm, they, there is no renaissance in U.S. manufacturing, and it's not going to happen under uh, existing um, uh, legislative uh, regime basically incentives it, it's just uh, too many too much uh, apparently red tape too much bureaucracy uh, in the us and that's apparently what's holding it back and then there is some investment in ip which is mostly is um, software but okay it's it's obviously is 
on the positive because it actually uh, increases productivity. But um, you know, again, it's very one-sided. So uh, nothing of sort of product, you know, no, no, nothing is being manufacturing manufactured. And it's actually I looked at the and it's um, I looked at the one number uh, is how much uh, are payrolls in total in us in manufacturing versus government jobs it's very interesting that they are equal so which is absolutely not normal as you can imagine that uh, government which is totally gov governmental employees which is totally not productive uh, earn the same the spending in the economy is the same amount as on people who actually produce something that's useful for everyone um, then there is some export which is also was sharply down so this is goes back again to this uh, china situation and, and overall um, this disintegration of the global uh, economy uh, then uh, it's actually interesting but uh, governmental spending also was down significantly uh, it's still up 1.3 percent but if we look why it's up 1.3 it's actually because of the state state governments in the u.s not the federal government federal government is actually uh, cut expenses and this is actually tying back why um, u.s governmental debt stopped growing as well so that's additional uh, revenues from tax collection and then uh, sharp decline in governmental spending actually it went it went down so that really stabilized uh, for now uh, government debt situation in the US I'll uh, probably in a week when the numbers will come out we'll look more in detail uh, in the budget situation in the US and specifically interest expense which is um, I would say uh, growing uh, out of control I mean it's not out of control it's it's a it's a outcome of rising interest rates and and, and huge amount huge pile of debt this uh, 30 uh, 34.6 trillion um so we'll look into that in in about a week when numbers come out but to kind of understand better where things are going but uh the the key here is government stop spending this is also reason why gdp went down significantly as you can see from first quarter of 23 where it was 3.4 percent now it's 1.3 so Again, this driven by, um, you know, consumer that's in U.S. is hurting, uh, and also reduction in governmental spending. So effectively, all of those positive numbers in 2023 in the U.S. are largely product of governmental spending and basically borrowing, right? So it's just recycling that uh, to to through revenues, which creates GDP. And this is really, uh, in a nutshell, a very primitive way, obviously, what is going, what was going on in 2023 in the U.S. Uh, then if we look at uh, the, the PCE, this is basically proxy for inflation. Uh, it's, I would say, it's not really under control. As you can see, uh, the, the general number is 3.3%. And actually, X food and energy, which were volatile and can go up or down, uh, the sort of more stable uh, components, they grew actually higher than the general number. So basically, uh, there was positive effect from food and energy uh, that was helping to basically hide uh, inflation, the true size of inflation in the U.S. And as you can see, it's 3.6%. Uh, that's definitely not anywhere close to 2% that U.S. Federal Reserve wants. And what this really means is that uh, the rate, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the reduction in rates in, 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 in the U.S. economy is not coming, let's say, soon. It's probably, probably not coming anytime soon because uh, I, I show that uh, there is inflation in China. This really means that uh, that that will translate into inflation eventually in the U.S. So s inflation is not under control, and the reason it's not under control, as I stated before, is because of disintegrating global economy. Uh, and as long as it's disintegrating, inflation is not going to get under control, and it's going to be 
problem and the interest rates are gonna remain probably where they are because if there is attempt to 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 reduce them inflation will just flare up even stronger uh, and there will be much more pain than than from current status quo so in in other words it's, it's a situation where you know uh, heads you lose uh, uh, the tails you lose so there's it's a lose lose situation it's just uh, um, at this point it's more like um, uh, how to go through to go through this with least amount of pain there's no question there's going to be pain uh, and that's really the, the the sort of strategic situation in this uh, then if we look at the uh, employment situation in U.S., which is presented by continuing jobless claims, remains at this one point roughly 8 million, which is sort of normal. There is no spike in unemployment in U.S. And initial um, uh, job, basically initially like laid off people. Uh, this is also two, roughly 220, which is also a normal number. So nothing abnormal uh, in the labor market. Labor market is holding on in the U.S., uh, which is actually true elsewhere as well. Like I look at the numbers in Italy, it's also got sort of tighter even uh, in Italy. So things are um, labor-wise is still... Um, stable i'm not saying it's it's definitely worse than it used to be a year ago two years ago there's no question about that uh but it's still fairly okay job market um and people remain employed which also means that um, prices for real estate probably will continue staying where they are or slowly going down it's unlikely there's any kind of crash uh, imminent unless obviously there is imminent round of uh, layoffs which uh, as i stated there is no indication that they are coming you know soon maybe who knows maybe in the fall but uh, this is totally hypothetical okay now let's uh, switch to the situation in ukraine specifically on the battlefield in ukraine actually before i jump to battlefield in ukraine uh, Russian president um, uh, gave a speech uh, and he uh, clearly made a threat uh, that uh, Russia may use uh, nuclear weapons against some European countries and specifically he was referring countries that are um, giving Ukraine, uh, Ukraine F-16s. Um, so that's... Um, uh, I would say, obviously, um, it's a, it's another step to escalation. And in a nutshell, there is not you know you cannot treat it any other way. Um, now it's actually uh, look. Uh, I'm gonna uh, look at general situation on the front line. Uh, so far, uh, the front line is more or less contained temporarily by ukrainian forces uh, not because things are truly under control is just um, ukraine commands through extra resources uh, to prop up the front line once those resources are expanded in in the process of attrition uh, the, the 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 things will go back to sort of typical situation where you can have significant um, breakthrough of Russian troops. At this moment, generally, uh, the losses are very contained to small sort of squeezes that are also expensive for, for Russian side. So, uh, so in a nutshell, yes, Russia is uh, gaining ground, but it's very small. It's, you know, non-consequential uh, from big picture perspective. But... Uh, the situation is building up where um, Russian troops may have, uh, you know, true significant advances, similar to how it was uh, near Ocheret. And uh, this is, was a perfect example of that situation. Uh, I wouldn't call Kharkiv uh, attack uh, near Kharkiv is truly uh, that case. It was a different situation. Uh, it was, as I explained, it was a horrific uh, decision-making by uh, 
the Ukrainian military, top military command, uh, and also uh, obviously civilian administration that was um, looks like um, at best negligent and worse were just simply stealing uh, the money that were allocated uh, to building defensive lines. But in any case, it's complete mess and there is no nothing positive to say there. So uh, let's actually do a walkthrough in a clockwise fashion, the way I always do. So first we're going to uh, look at the situation uh, east of Kharkiv or northeast of Kharkiv. Things uh, more or less the same, nothing, nothing truly changing. Um, continuing Russian attacks uh, in the area of Lipsy is actually around, like in the, the, the attacks more focused uh, at the heights that are sort of, um, call it uh, east uh, of Lipsy. That's the key heights that kind of like a key holding, a key key area to control uh, to control this whole area, including. Uh, ability to uh, direct, have direct uh, artillery fire at Kharkiv. Uh, Russian troops are not successful. Ukrainian troops are holding defense there. And then uh, situation stabilized in Vovchansk. Uh, it's uh, unclear how exactly front line is going through Vovchansk, but uh, basically the, the town is split between uh, Ukrainian and Russian forces. Um, sometimes it used to be that the Russian forces controlled all of the northern part. Uh, there are sometimes reports that Ukrainian troops managed to sort of push back a little bit, but I would say largely the northern part, uh, nor and by that I mean north of this Volcha River, is uh, controlled by Russian troops. And the southern part of the town are controlled by Ukrainian. As I stated before, the core of the town is really northern part. Now let's look at the situation at uh, North Luhansk front line. Um, things here more or less the same. Russian pressure, the uh, continuing attacks uh, in direction of Kupyansk. There are small advances, as I mentioned before. You know, 200 meters uh, here, there, 300 meters, and so on. Uh, nothing sort of large or significant is happening from that perspective. Similar situation here in this area of um, uh, Serebransky, uh, Serebransky forest, uh, things, you know, Russian pressure, but it's actually even, uh, I would say the advances there are pretty much minimal or non-existent by Russian troops. And this is largely because there is this uh, Azov brigade, which um, much more motivated. It actually doesn't have as good equipment uh, as some other brigades, like, for example, uh, relative to 47th brigade. But uh, motivation does matter, and it's extremely important uh, characteristic. Uh, now let's move to the situation on the North and Bas front line. Things here are also more or less the same. Strong Russian pressure toward to capture Bilohorivka. Uh, there are some minor advances by Russian troops, but uh, the, the the village is still uh, in Ukrainian hands. Uh, then situation. Uh, uh, West of Bakhmut is also more or less the same in terms of meaning that Russian troops are stuck. They do try to build their sort of northern pincer. They attack. They um, they advanced into this village Kalinivka, uh, but they still don't control the, the entire village. But they slowly kind of like build, building this northern pincer that I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, the way everything goes here, it's going to take quite a while. Um, for Russian troops to make any significant advances here. Uh, now let's look at the situation uh, on the central and bus front line. Things here also more or less the same. No major advances by Russian troops. Uh, they are basically attacking uh, Ukrainian strongholds in this villages Novo Alexandrivka, Novo Pokrovskia, and uh, here in this. Um, uh, west of Umanske, it's kind of like in some ways dead then, so Russian troops really need to, uh, there are two main passes, uh, the main one is actually along this railroad here, and then uh, down there um, in the village uh, south of Netailova, so in, in some ways 
the the the, the frontal move here is not the best because there is this uh, artificial uh, water reservoirs and then there's smaller rivers here so the pass uh, is is towards this uh, village progress and then down in and then sort of from there so that's our sort of gonna be major uh, Russian thrust but so far um, no major advances there um, so um, this is just big picture this is what I was talking is that um, this is this uh, area of Chiretin and Progress where um, this is uh, this railroad that Russian where it's going to be main pass for Russian troops to advance there and in addition obviously they can advance north and then this Natailova is this road south of this um, uh, water reservoir so those are two main sort of passes for Russian troops um, in terms of immediate goals. Uh, Russian troops are still going through Krasnohorivka. Uh, Ukrainian troops slowly but surely losing it, um, but um, they still hold on to the um, western and uh, northern, northwestern parts of it. So uh, it's still, the Russian troops are still kind of going through that. No major advances here in this area, west of Novomikhailovka and west of Marinka. There is small, you know, you know, snail pace kind of moves there. Uh, now let's look at the situation on the uh, Zaporizhia front line. Um, things here are also more or less the same. Uh, some Russian pressure uh, around Rubotine, uh and then also pressure um, towards Urozhaine and Staromayorsky. Russian troops actually do have some small progress, but meaningful progress in uh, village of Staromayorsky. Mm, so um, again, nothing major, no breakthrough, just a, a primitive squeeze that caused both sides and, and uh, is unlikely to lead to anything significant. Uh, then uh, situation along the Dnipro River remains kind of unclear to to great extent. Um, it, it does appear that uh, Ukrainian um, troops. Uh, I would say lost the bridgehead, but there might be some kind of presence, just a formal presence. But it does look that uh, the tide has changed here as well, where uh, basically Ukrainian side is completely on the defensive. And uh, at this point, just simply trying to hold on to the western uh, bank of the river. And that's that's sort of the plan maximum, let's put this way, for Ukrainian troops there. Uh, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Bye-bye.